New developments coming to light in the newly released taped phone call involving a Valley Honor killing case. Friends and classmates are in shock right now after two teenage sisters are murdered, police say, by their own father. <laughs> Allah says, Mary, all the women of your choice, Ithna, which is two, the last three, Arba, which is four. Are women oppressed in Islam? Is the religion predominantly male-dominated? Have they been portrayed negatively in the Quran? These are just some of the questions that have been highlighted, spreading confusion and misconception about the status of women in Islam. Many a time women have been considered inferior to men, an idea commonly taken by verses from the Qur'an. This documentary aims to highlight these common misconceptions surrounding the status of women, dissecting the verses which have often caused outrage and confusion. Most of the time when men and women are discussed in the Holy Quran, there is not a gender hierarchy or a difference set up. And there are a number of ways in which men and women are discussed. And as many people who are familiar with the Holy Quran know, there are a number of verses uh, which specifically indicate that they are directed at both men and women. That is to say, they include both masculine and feminine plurals uh, to indicate that males and females are the addressees, just in case someone was not sure whether this verse also includes females. This, of course, is not necessary because we understand that the entirety of the Holy Quran, unless otherwise specified, is for both men and women. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to say our prayers and that prayers keep us from evil or ugly deeds, this is not something for men, obviously only. It is for men and for women. Nevertheless, to emphasize this point that many things should be taken as true for males and females, in his ultimate wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did specify men and women. For example, the very famous verse of the Holy Quran, uh, which in fact, uh, one of the reasons why it said it was revealed is that one of the female companions of the Holy Prophet وسلم, uh, asked whether or not women are included in the Holy Quran or, wh or where. Uh, this verse, uh, which many of us are familiar with, وَالْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ So the Muslim men, the Muslim women, the believing men, the believing women, uh, the obedient men and the obedient women. So in this regard, for example, uh, men and women are not discussed separately. Uh, even when it comes to the verses or the verse regarding the creation of human beings, again, uh, the creation story is not gendered. Uh, it's different, for example, than the account which became popular in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, which says that Eve was created from Adam. Uh, the account of human creation doesn't say the female was created from the male or that sort of thing. It's much more general. There often is a discussion in many circles, especially in the West, when it comes to the way Islam deals with women generally. And there are verses that are normally scrutinized and placed as uh, examples of somehow people claiming that uh, women are viewed as inferior to uh, men. And of course, uh, we have to look at the Qur'an in its entirety. We uh, advocate an idea that the verses cannot be looked at in isolation. Of course, hadith and narrations from the Prophet and his holy progeny, peace and blessings be upon them, should always be put next to the Qur'an in un attempting to understand the verses and the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in general, we look at the Qur'an and we see that in many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses men and women and highlights the fact that the most important quality regardless of whether one is male or female is God consciousness in akramakum and Allahi atqaakum there is an interesting verse that is found in chapter 16 verse 97 where Allah says man amila salihan min dhakarin aw untha whoever does righteous deeds if they are male 
or female. And here, the scholars say that uh, when the word uh, man amila is used, it is in reference to anybody. So the Quran essentially, when it speaks about a group of people, would address them whoever does so and so. But then there's a question: Why is Allah mentioned dhakar and untha, male and female, specifically? And this fits into the idea that we get when we understand and examine the Quran, and that is Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter whether you belong to a particular gender. If you do righteous deeds in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa taala, Allah will give you this godly or goodly life, hayatun tayyibah. One particular verse, which is in chapter two, verse two two eight. Uh, the Quran essentially gives an idea, or as people would look at it, rijal daraja, that men somehow enjoy a position, a degree uh, above women. This ayah, if we look at it, is talking in the context of divorce and is talking about the period of time that is um, perhaps prescribed or legislated when it comes to females known as the adda and by which for instance uh, the marriage can be reinitiated in accordance with the different islamic uh, jurisprudential laws but why does the quran say that the male has a, a degree over the female well, this degree mustn't be understood as superiority, but it needs to be viewed in the idea that males and females are equal but different. In, what, in which way are they equal and different? So today science tells us that as far as the physiological makeup of the male and female, they have different types of abilities, different strengths, um, their makeup or setup is completely different in, in the way God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them. Unfortunately, we get this idea in the West that uh, males and females, as far as their roles and responsibilities and duties under the umbrella of equality should all be the same. Quran says, no, in the eyes of Allah, they're both equal, but with different roles and responsibilities, with different duties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 228. Basically, this verse is speaking about the issue of divorce and disagreement between the husband and the wife and then encourages reconciliation and mutual understanding that one should not rush to divorce his spouse even if they have disagreements because the institution of marriage is not supposed to be uh, an institution of complete agreement with one another definitely there are disagreements and views and approaches and you know and the way we understand things but it is an institution of cooperation. Despite our differences, different views, we have to live together and try to reconcile these differences. And therefore here is advising men by saying, وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةً this, this is a specific context. Men have a degree above women in responsibility. This is not about gender preference. God is not trying to say that men are above women in creation, in intelligence, in piety or righteousness or nobility or this or that. It's not about that. This is not gender preference. This is not putting one gender above the other. Here, God has a specific point to present. He's saying that in these matters of disagreement and conflict, domestic conflicts, men have a degree of responsibility above women. They have to be more responsible. Why they have to be more responsible? Because it was the man who initiated the marriage with the, with the woman. He started the marriage. He started the family. He proposed to her. He asked for her hand. So since he was the main person who initiated this marriage 
and she's the wife is his partner, then he has more responsibility. More responsibility in taking care of his wife and his children and the integrity and the safety and the health and the progress of his family. It's not about putting men above women in any way. They are both equal in the eyes of Allah. They are equal in the creation, equal in their responsibilities, equal in their role. We cannot say the role of men is more important than women. No. The ayah in Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 34, الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض. So the idea that emerges here is that people translate this to say uh, that men have a degree above women. But the verse goes on to explain how this is the case. And in, this is in particularly uh, reference to the idea of a household. What we are told is that in any institution, in any endeavor, in any project, you need somebody who is essentially a leader. But one of the most important qualities of a leader is consultation, is seeking advice, is creating that, this atmosphere of harmony, of um, people feeling involved in the decision-making process. And that's essentially how a successful leader is measured. In the household, it is the same. A harmonious relationship, one that is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A successful marriage is one where the husband and wife work together in harmony and in synchronized fashion in order to achieve uh, happiness in this world and the hereafter. An-Nisa, verse number chapter 4. الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم. Again, قوامون has different interpretations. You cannot find one unified interpretation of the Holy Quran. It depends on the person, on his preferences, on his understanding of the Quran, on where he came from, where he is coming from on his tradition, his school of thought. We in the school of Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet, believe that the, the correct interpretation and the authentic interpretation of the word Qawwamun means maintainers and providers. So men have to maintain, maintain material and immaterial aid and help to their families. قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا. Since they have the wealth and they have to spend from their own wealth, then they have responsibility in maintaining and protecting and providing for the family. This is the meaning. It does not mean that they are in control. They are not in control. There is no dictatorship in the institution of family. The institution of family should be based on a mutual understanding, on a mutual uh, cooperation, on a mutual help. Even the decision making has to be shared. The man cannot make a decision away, completely away from his wife's opinion or ideas or say. He cannot say to her, listen, you are nothing. I just married you. You just follow me. I'm the first class citizen, you are second class citizen, I am above you, anything I say you have to follow me. Nothing like that in the Quran. But some people might ask, why is it that the female not, is not in charge? Let's assume and maybe um, flip the equation and argue that this particular um, statement in the Quran, this fact that the men should be looking after the affairs of the household in general. In other words, the last say should be theirs in that respect. Why is it not the women? And the idea, of course, that emerges today, science tells us, that the way the males and the women and, and the females are created are different in the sense that males are more uh, uh, physically inclined towards, towards uh, being more um, uh, active in, in the sense of going out, working, and so on, and so on, whereas females are more emotionally based. In other words, the role that the woman or the mother has at home cannot be fulfilled by the father or the husband in terms of showing compassion, in terms of love, empathy, care for the children as well as the husband. 
So that has also a role to do with, or has, has a link to do with the overall makeup and the structure of the family. And this family unit that the religion of Islam wants to cherish and wants to preserve and wants to look after. And in order for that to happen, we need to make sure that things are placed in the right position. And this is in Arabic what's known as hikmah. Hikmah is essentially putting things where they belong in accordance with what the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted in accordance to the way he has created us. Many believe that women in Islam don't have the right to initiate a divorce. Rather, such a decision lies solely with the husband. Is there any truth behind this or is it merely one more misconception? What is very popular, there is a pop popular axiom, Islamic law, a piece of law, that says, The decision for divorce is in the hand of the one who initiated the marriage. So since the husband initiated the marriage, then he has the right of divorcing his wife. Now, is this justice? Is this good? Sometimes the wife cannot bear that marriage anymore. Life for her is like hell. She wants to get out of it. She wants to save what is, you know, remaining of her dignity and life. And the husband says, no, either you give me my dowry or in some cases, give me a million dollars, let's say. I will set you free. He puts conditions, which is unfair and un-Islamic and unacceptable in Islam. Islam says either you live with her on equal footing of justice and kindness, good treatment, human treatment, consider her to be your friend, your wife, your soulmate, or if you have a problem, you cannot reconcile the differences, you are always quarreling, disagreeing, and that is going to affect your children their personality, their character, you're going to lose your children, then end it peacefully with divorce. Now, as to why the husband has the right to initiate the divorce and uh, make it happen, whereas the wife normally doesn't, there are a number of things to keep in mind. First of all, the wife is able to make a condition um, before marriage and during the marriage itself by being the agent, the wakil of the husband in making the divorce happen if certain things happen, for instance, by the agreement of the husband and the wife. So that option exists. Many people don't know about this option, but the you know, religion of Islam allows the females in certain instances um, to have that ability, number one. Number two, in general, if that doesn't happen, why is it in, uh, that the male has or the husband has the right? It's the fact that, of course, a female is more emotional. Uh, perhaps she might jump into a conclusion or initiate the process or ask for divorce if she was allowed to in that sense without due reflection, without due contemplation. Um, and, and, it, and of course, this is in a physiological makeup. Uh, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created her, certainly at the t certain times of the month, it's, it's, it's something that has to be said as well. So, whereas the male uh, or the husband is, is um, hoping, uh, hopefully more able to make a measured and more of a um, uh, balanced approach to, to this. When we say divorce is initiated by men, that does not mean women cannot ask for divorce. Women can ask for divorce if they are unhappy and if they work very hard to, to reconcile the differences but they failed because the husband was reluctant or irresponsible or careless, then she has to petition for divorce. She cannot just simply say to him, Talaq, you are divorced, I'm running away from you. She has to petition it goes through certain process, but ultimately they're going to grant her the divorce. They're going to look into her case. If the case is valid, legitimate, definitely they have to grant her the divorce. God does not want her to, to be tortured. God does not intend torture for, for any human being. If this marriage reaches a dead end, there is no way for a breakthrough, for a progress, for, and it becomes not only a dead end, it becomes 
a hell for both of them or one of them. She's going to get sick, depressed, you know, uh, distraught, hopeless, helpless. Then definitely at that condition, at that state, Islam says, you are free. It has been widely assumed that Islam encourages polygamy through the words used in the Holy Quran. Marry the women that seem good to you, two, three, or four. We take a deeper look into the exact meaning of this verse and its wider context. The subject of polygamy and how Islam has allowed men to marry up to for women has been the subject of discussion and attack from many corners and the ayah of course specifically that allows and gives the permissibility for men to do this is found in surah an nisa chapter 4 verse number 3 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after beginning the discussion by talking about orphans and so the ayah has two elements to it first of all it talks about the eight term and then speaks about marriage and the polygamous uh, permissibility. Now, why does it start with the orphans? Well, the idea back in the time, at the time of the 7th century Arabia, that they used to adopt or somehow look after certain, certain orphan females. And later on, they would somehow marry them, but mistreat uh, them and abuse them and abandon them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, has warned against this type of treatment. But then goes on to say, That you are permitted to marry from women two, three, and or four. Now, people ask why. Why is this permissible? Why, why four wives? Of course, number one, we have to understand this comes with terms and conditions. And these are not necessarily easy to implement. What are the terms and conditions? Well, first of all, there needs to be implementation of justice, adala, in between uh, the, the wives concerned. What does this mean? Does this mean that the love has to be shared across them? No, it's impossible because the Quran in another ayah says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدًا Or actually in this ayah says, if, you are, if, you're not, if you're not be just, then one. But in another verse says, وَلَنْ تَسْتَطِيعُوا أَنْ تَعْدِلُوا You will never be able to be just. And some people say, well, that ayah has somewhat abrogated the, the other. It hasn't. It simply says, you as males, as human beings, you'll never be able to share your love amongst your wives. That's impossible. But justice in terms of spending time with them, and as far as the financial element and aspect and uh, the looking after of, uh, of, of the wives, these have to be uh, put in place. Islam said, to those who are wealthy, and to those who can implement justice between their wives, they are allowed. We are not saying that you must. We are saying you are allowed if you afford financially, morally, socially. You can afford having a second wife to save her, to save her dignity, to save, to save her life. Then you are allowed to marry her. If you think about it, back in the time, uh, the the time of Jahile, they used to marry many. So it is mentioned that uh, sometimes more than ten uh, wives were married. Uh, some men had more than ten wives, for instance. So it was a common practice. But thirdly, importantly, men are more prone to death, and reduction in number of men is more widely seen around the world than women due to wars sometimes due to famine and due to the responsibilities and accidents and so on. We see this even in today in many countries like in Iraq recently. In my visit, I met many widows and they would talk about how their husbands would go seek livelihood and never return because of the terrorist bombings that happened there and so on and so forth. So the question is then, what happens to these women? Who would look after them? What about their emotional needs? 
What about their physical wants? Um, Islam is a religion that offers solutions. Islam is a comprehensive system. Uh, this verse did not expand the permission for polygamy in society. Instead, it restricted it. So before uh, the advent of the Islamic legislation, polygamy was unrestricted in the society. And this said, sorry, you can only have four wives. Uh, you can't have 20 or however many some very rich people might have had in the past. Uh, so it's not like it uh, opened the door, but instead it put a restriction on it. This topic is one of the most controversial regarding the Qur'an. The mainstream teaching is that a husband is allowed to hit his wife as a last resort in specific circumstances. To what extent is this verse applicable? Ayah 34 of Surah An-Nisa is considered to be one of the most controversial ayat when it comes to dealing with misconceptions regarding women in the religion of Islam. So not only talks about the idea of the degree that men enjoy over women as far as responsibility is concerned, but it also referred to in some circles as the wife beating verse. And it's important for us, of course, to have a correct understanding uh, of the ayah and look at it through the context of revelation and at the same time what it actually means. The ayah talks about two groups of women. So first of all, speaks about those righteous individuals who are obedient to their husbands and at the same time keep the matters that happen in the house within the four walls of the house, so to speak, um, and are, do not divulge the secrets of their marital relationship to others. The Qur'an says these are salihat, these are righteous women. And the Qur'an says with those you need to honor them, you need to respect them, you need to cherish them. Then the Qur'an talks about a second group of women. Now here the idea is what? Uh, the idea that is given is regarding nushuz. Wallati takhafuna nushuzahun. What is nushuz? Nushuz is simply disobedience. But it's very important that we understand this. Disobedience not related to an, an external factor. Disobedience not related to a problem that has happened. Disobedience simply because of stubbornness. Disobedience because simply the wife wants to disobey. And here the Quran is restricting it to a very specific group of people. Because certainly sometimes what happens in a marital relationship is that there might be some disagreement, there might be some uh, discussion uh, which could be heated. This is not part of this particular description. Nishuz is, according to our ulama, when there is evidence presented by the wife of unrelated uncooperation and not willing to fulfill their duties and responsibilities. Simply they just don't, don't feel like it, or they don't want to do it. Within the whole context of looking at this, uh, the, the general element, certainly the Qur'an is against violence against women, against abuse of women, against any aspect which causes injury uh, or, 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 or pain, so to speak, in that regard. In Surah An-Nisa, uh, chapter 4, verse Verse 34, the Holy Quran states, وَاللَّاتِي تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ فَعِذُوهُنَّ وَهْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ وَضْرِبُوهُنَّ وَضْرِبُوهُنَّ فَإِنْ أَطَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبْغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيًّا كَبِيرًا This is in case where we had conflict in the family. And the conflict is so severe that it is threatening the stability and the integrity of the institution of marriage. And for no reason, the wife is disobedient. Sometimes there is a reason. There is a reason. Sometimes the wife, the wife has to disobey her husband. If he forces her to do something illegal, an illegal act, whether with herself or with the house, 
with the children in the community, something illegal. So sometimes she has to disobey him. Sometimes she disobeys him for a reason, legitimate reason. She's unhappy. This is a form of protest. He's doing something bad, so she's protesting, therefore she's disobeying him. But sometimes she's disobeying him, being reluctant to fulfill her responsibility, responsibilities rather, or not only that, she's doing something gross, gross violation, something shameful. Then he has to go through steps. Quran gives a step-by-step -step approach on how to deal with this problem, this issue. So the first thing the Quran says, فَعِضُوهُنَّ Give them advice. Now what does this advice mean? It doesn't mean that the husband comes and sits down and says, okay, now you need to obey me. That doesn't always work. You need to understand the psychology of males and females and how we address each other. The art of communication is so crucial in a successful marital relationship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says فَعِضُوهُنَّ That means talk to them softly, gently, even crack jokes. Make the atmosphere something comfortable. In other words, present yourself in the best possible way. That all falls under this category of being somebody who gives advice wholeheartedly, honestly, and sincerely. If that doesn't work, the Quran says, then it says, وَهْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ Which means what? Which means somewhat uh, keep away from them, certainly in a physical relationship, in bed, and, and so on. And that sometimes has a detrimental effect upon the woman when, the, when the, she feels that she's not loved or she's not being looked after and she's not being cherished and so on. And this is the second step that the Quran presents. The third one that the, that the, the ayah says is, of course, وضربوهن. Here, our ulama have highlighted a number of factors. First of all, this idea of hit them, and in my humble opinion, it should not be translated as beat them, because the verse clearly says وضربوهن. And, and, and beating implies something which is aggressive, which is violent, which causes injury. Our ulama say that there should be no injury, there should be no redness of the skin, there should be no blood, and so on and so forth. Each of these require compensation. Uh, and, and it's not permissible. Uh, violence against the female is not permissible. But some people will say, why is this allowed in the first place? Why hit them? We said, first of all, these are only in certain exceptional circumstances of women not responding to this gradual prescription that the Quran has presented. God says, the, the jurists, they say, jurists, fuqaha, they say you should not leave any marks. So use this. But they say it is more psychological than physical. The effect of it might not be physical. It doesn't hurt. doesn't hurt her. But it is psychological. It's an ex expression of repulsion that, listen, I hate what you are doing. I don't like what you are doing. You have to stop this. Now they say, if this effective, you think it's effective, you may use it. If not, don't use it altogether. Beside, as I said, it's only for severe cases that it threatens the stability of the family. One thing that has been said is this verse was revealed in a society where uh, men were oftentimes hitting their wives. And so this verse was designed to cut down on that because usually if a man is about to hit his wife or vice versa, and this is an instantaneous thing. It's not something someone sits and thinks about for a few days, you know, should I hit her? Maybe I'll hit her tomorrow yeah, at three o'clock. It's not something planned out. And yet this verse is saying, don't do that initially. First go and talk to her and go sleep somewhere else. And so there's a lot of time elapsed. So no one is really going to go all the way to the end of that and then hit someone.
Uh, and there is a hadith, I, I believe it's also shared with the Sunnis uh, and the Shi'is as well, uh, that hitting <clears throat> in this regard is very light with a, a miswak, so like a, a twig or something. So not in actually to harm someone, but just to make a point. And there's another interpretation that's become a bit more popular in recent years, and that is Dharba here doesn't actually mean hit. Uh, because when we say uh, that could have any number of meanings. We know words in any language can have lots of meanings. Uh, one meaning that's been proposed is go away from them. So if it doesn't work to sleep away from them, then just go away from them for a while entirely. And I think the main evidence that's given to support that is the Holy Prophet uh, when he, there was domestic discord in his household, because things did not always go well uh, in his household, uh, he never hit his wives. There's no evidence that he or the imams, peace be upon them, ever hit their wives, even though some of their wives were very challenging people. Uh, nonetheless, uh, he never hit them, but he would sometimes go and go away from them for a little bit if there were problems in the household. Many are under the impression that women must stay in their houses and should not venture outside, as apparently the Qur'an commands them to do so. We will take a look at what this verse entails and how it has been interpreted. Here, the Holy Qur'an is addressing a specific group of people, not the entire women in the community. Those are the wives of the Prophet, Ya Nisa and Nabi, the beginning of the verse. 32 in chapter 33, Surah Al Ahzab. This is a prophecy by the Quran for some of the wives of the Prophet, actually one of them, for the future after the death of the Prophet. Stay indoors, don't leave your house, because one of them, Allah knows through His eternal knowledge, that one of them is going to mobilize troops and is going to fight one of the legitimate caliphs, which is Imam Ali alayhi salam. So he was addressing her ahead of time. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ Do not discipline yourself the way at the time of, at the time of ignorance where women used to discipline the, her, her, their attractions and their beauty and their bodies in public. Don't do that. You have to be very careful of how to conduct yourself and how to carry yourself in the society. Because when people look at you as the wife of the Prophet and you are not doing good, they would not say, oh, this lady is not doing good. They say Islam is not doing good. The Prophet is not doing good. They attribute this to the entire institution, not just you as a person. So you have a big responsibility of being extra careful in how you carry yourself out. And therefore, qarna fi buyutikun is not a general instructions to all the Muslim women that you stay indoors and do nothing and just serve the men and don't venture outside the house. It's not for God knows that women have to go outside the house. Sometimes they have to work outside the house. Sometimes they have to help their families and their children outside the house, outside the venue of the house. So this is not a general command forbidding women from venturing outside their properties. The idea that is espoused by the ayah and how our mufassirin uh, have interpreted it is a number of ways. Number one, back in the time in Jahiliyyah, uh, they, uh, the women used to come out of their homes not dressed in the correct manner. So in other words, the idea of hijab was not well practiced, of course, until after Islam came forward and legislated hijab. And it was at the beginning. It took people time to understand the full Islamic dress code of modesty and chastity. So some of our scholars have come forward with the idea that this notion of staying at home, it is in reference to the idea that people used to leave their homes but not dressed in the appropriate manner. So the conclusion is, if you are to leave your homes and if you're not presenting yourself in the right way, it is better to stay at home. That is one understanding. And of course, that is better for them and also for the moral uh, health of the general community and society. They are told that if they do good deeds, they will receive a double reward in heaven. 
but if they do wrong deeds, they will receive a double punishment. So they have an extra responsibility because they're associated with the Messenger of Allah and sometimes the hypocrites of Medina would try to attack Islam through the wives of the Holy Prophet. So they have this extra responsibility and now this is not forced on them. The Holy Quran also gives them the option to leave the Holy Prophet if they don't accept it. So it says these are the conditions. You know, also they have to live a simple life and so forth. Uh, if they want something else, if they want to be rich, for example, they can divorce the Holy Prophet without a problem and go and start a new life. But if they accept to stay with him, then they need to agree to follow these conditions. Uh, one of the things that's mentioned is that the wives of the Holy Prophet should stay in their houses. That's where this verse comes from. Okay, it's very clearly being addressed to them. It even says, in case we uh, don't uh, figure it out, you are not like other women. So therefore, this verse is clearly not being addressed to women in general. It's for a specific group of women who are not like other women. And indeed, there's no evidence that Muslim women in the prophetic era did in fact stay in their houses in terms of being hidden from society. This is something that came into some Islamic cultures later on. This cannot be, this ayah cannot be interpreted that women cannot go out, far from it. For instance, the daughters of Prophet Shu'aib, in hadith they're referred to as Leah and Safura, they both went out to seek to get some water from the well and they met Musa salam, didn't they? And they, of course, Musa saw them that they couldn't take the water, they needed help, which means that they were going out the house, they were going about certain tasks and performing certain duties. You find, for instance, in the history of Islam, many women did the same. Sayyida Zainab sallallahu alayha would accompany Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi with many other women in the journey to Karbala and she had such a pivotal role. So. We do not look at this verse to mean that women cannot have a role in society. In fact, they can play an important role, especially in this day and age, by presenting the correct image of the religion of Islam to others, and by adorning the Islamic dress code of hijab, and by telling people how hijab for themselves is indeed liberating, and indeed something, a dress code which they wear with pride and honor, and interacting with others. In Islam, a woman is to receive half of the man's inheritance in the case of a deceased father. We delve into the reason for this Islamic ruling and why this has been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah An-Nisa, verse number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that as far as the inheritance is concerned, the male gets uh, what is equal or what is given to two, females um, and so some people ask why this is the case first of all the reason for this is because of the fact that as far as the male and their responsibilities concerned is much more than the female financially so if they were to get married they're the ones who have to pay the dowry they'll have to look after the female and the children whereas the ma uh, female does not have to do this there's no financial burden or responsibility on her Let's read Surah An-Nisa, verse number 11. يُوصِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ God ordains you uh, to inherit your children. The male gets the double share of the female. لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ for the simple fact that the male has a bigger financial responsibility. When he gets married, he has to spend on his family, he has to spend on his wife, he has to spend on his children. So when he gets his share, he, he, he gets a double share than his, let's say, sister, because he has also a double responsibility. His resp financial responsibility is much greater. While his sister, she can get her share, though it is half, 50%, but she doesn't have to spend it, she can save it. When she gets married, she doesn't spend on the family. She's not obliged, even now, even now, working mothers, let's say, working wives, okay? Even if they earn money, Islam does not oblige them to spend that money on the family, on the sustenance of the family. Because the 
sustenance and the provision of the family is solely the responsibility of the husband. Islam has not made jihad wajib, physical struggle in the battlefield, on the woman. And this requires funding as, as well, as, as for the male, it requires financial backup uh, to look after the family. And number two, Islam hasn't, hasn't made it obligatory for the wife or the female to pay the dowry, whereas it is obligatory upon the male. And number three, if there is in Islamic criminal law, if somebody is killed and there is, needs to be compensation that's paid, if there's a female in the family, she's ex excluded from this particular paying of this compensation. Imam Sadiq says she doesn't have to pay. It's not, you know, it's not obligatory upon her to pay. So that element taking, uh, taken in mind helps to bring the idea as to why Islam sees that the male needs to have a bigger portion of the inheritance. There is one interesting delicate point about the ayah that the Mufassirin say. Mufassirin say that the central point in the discussion uh, in this ayah is the female. In which way? The ayah says, That there are two females and the male gets the same as two females, the way the ayah is constructed. And it doesn't say that the male, uh, the, the, the female gets half of the male. There's a difference. It doesn't make the ma male the subject of the discussion. It makes the female the subject of the discussion and says the male gets what two females get. Whereas it could have said the female gets what ha half of what the male gets. So it, it focuses on the idea of the importance of giving inheritance to the female. Why? Because in Jahiliya, at the time of uh, before Islam, women were inherited themselves between men. They did not have uh, any rights. No inheritance was given to them. Uh, and, and sometimes they were treated like animals in, in that respect. So Islam gave them dignity and honor and gave them special respect and value. And now, of course, someone might bring up the very obvious point, uh, but not all women are provided for. Uh, there are many women who have to pay for themselves or their children. So what about them? Uh, first of all, this is only about inheritance. It's not talking about salary or gifts or anything else. Uh, it's only about specific portions after someone dies. Obviously, if someone has a child and they feel that child, uh, male or female, is in need of financial assistance, they are more than free to offer it during their lifetime as a gift. Uh, the deceased, before they pass on, obviously, they have the option to allocate one third of their wealth uh, to anyone or anything they like. They can also uh, bequeath that part to the lady if they want. Now, suppose someone, a father, he loves his daughter. He has a daughter and he has a son, okay? And he loves his daughter and he does not want his daughter to get half, half of the share, 50%. He wants her to be equal to her brother. Is there any way for that? Legal way? Yes, there is a legal way. How is it? He has the right of making a will, wasiyah, with one third of his inheritance. He can dispose one third of his inheritance to any person as long as they are Muslims. It is believed that the male witness testimony is equivalent to that of two females. However, is this a case of misusing one verse and applying it to all situations, irrespective of context? The following segment explores this verse in more depth. In Surat Al-Baqarah, verse 282, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, shahidayni min rijalikum. When you take a loan from someone, it is advised that you bring two witnesses of your men to witness on that. For any financial transaction, actually. 
if you don't have two men farajulun one man and two women wamra'atan mimman tardawna min ash-shuhad shuhada from the one that you agree upon them both sides they agree yes we need those as witnesses why the reason why two women an tadilla ihdahuma fatudhakkira ihdahuma al-ukhra in case that one of the females is going to forget so the second one is going to support her and remind her of that because the quran says an tudilla ihdahuma in case one of them at the time of the testimony is not very forceful she feels sorry for him because the victim as soon as he he starts you know dropping some tears oh i didn't do i didn't do it you know i was under a lot of pressure he tried to attack me he tried to kill me i've seen them in the court sometimes we see them live on television you know a murderer who killed f- four or five people when he speaks when he presents his case you feel sorry for him you think he's the victim you would never think that he's he's the guy who killed because the way he's an artist the way he's presenting himself and defending himself so maybe maybe some females not all of them some of them they have strong heart you know some of them are going to feel sorry for him so they back up from their testimony so the second one comes and supports her and holds her hand to support her in her testimony there is a third interpretation women are more emotional than men more emotional so once in a while you find an iron lady like lady thatcher who died the other day once in a while very strong very assertive but in general god created them with more emotions because they have been endowed with the biggest and noblest responsibility on earth and that is to take care of the children and the family acting as witness is very sensitive in in islamic uh, teachings and if people uh, give the wrong um, testimony it is considered a, a very grave sin in that, in that respect and there's punishment for it as well if they do it deliberately so to speak um even if they've seen a particular like for instance in fornication if three males come forward uh, or two males and two females come forward to give a testimony that they've seen uh, a man and a woman uh, in an act of fornication these particular four people the two men and the two women will be punished even though they may swear that the actual the testimony was right and the dream temple reason is that they do not fulfill the criteria they need to fulfill the criteria of four men or three men and two women and so on so uh, testimony is very sensitive and very delicate and therefore these safeguards that have been presented there in the Quran to make sure that it's done in the correct manner hijab the female covering has caused much debate and discussion often used as a premise that women are oppressed in Islam neglecting the wisdom and deeper understanding behind it we unveil the verses that clarify these misunderstandings women need the hijab to declare that i am not cheap you can't treat me for my hair i don't want you to love me because the way i look the cheapest way of treating women the cheapest way if we treat them for the way they look so if she is oversized a little bit i despise her because this is the way she look allah wants us men to treat women based on their intellect on their personality on their character on their contribution on their worth and their value not the way they look if we base our judgment on the way they look in fact we are abusing them so if she's not very attractive then she worth nothing what i'm trying to say is that we do not measure the value of the people around us through their physical structure this is very wrong we are treating them in this case like animals not like a human beings because animals are measured by the colorful skin that they have the size of the skin that they have you know the speed that 
But human beings are different. We measure them by their brain, by their reason, intellectual power, spiritual power, their contribution, their character. This is why hijab is important. Because if women do not wear hijab, and hijab is not about a piece of a cloth or a scarf. Hijab, the, the, the one that covers the whole body. If they display their beauty and their attraction and their body parts, as if they are marketing themselves in a physical way, saying, all what I have, all the credit and the credential that I have is, let's say, this part of my body and that part of my body. And this is not good for her. The believing men are enjoined to lower their gaze, so not to look at women, uh, unless it's the wife, of course, uh, and to guard their chastity. Uh, and the women are also enjoined to lower their gaze, so not to stare at men, and to guard their chastity. And then you have the extra part about the hijab. Uh, so, of course, this is important for men and for women. Similarly, when it comes to modesty, the Holy Prophet وسلم, did say that every religion has its character, and the characteristic of my religion is modesty. Uh, so it's a very important part of the prophetic sunnah. Uh, the Holy Prophet and the Imams were all very modest people. Uh, it's part of our tradition as Muslims for both men and women to act and to dress and to conduct themselves with modesty in all aspects of life. We are not saying, Islam is not saying, women, you have to be covered from head to toe, and men, you go into the streets half naked. No, it's not like that. Women also, men also have to be conservative in their dress. Conservative in their dress. In certain societies, they say short sleeves for men is not good. It's not, especially when he goes into a religious institution. They have to wear long sleeves. Look at the way we, we wear, <laughs> the, the religious scholars. Complete hijab from head to toe. And this was the dress during the time of the Prophet and the Imams and the, you know, and even now in decent societies, even now, in many countries, decent societies, also men, they don't dis display their, their, their you know, body parts in front of male or females. So both have to observe to this. Hijab would never restrict women's activities and movements and contribution. Hijab would send a message that I respect my religion, I don't want to display my body parts, I want you, O oh man, to treat me as a real human being. Most of us will agree that when it comes to males and females, the main element that females are focused upon is their appearance, their beauty, the way they present themselves in a sense. So society generally looks at that and hence you find the products out there available when it comes to males and females for uh, beauty for, in the cosmetic world. It's centered around females, uh, essentially, primarily. And until very recently, products for males started to appear, whereas this wasn't the case back in the time. Uh, and hence, Islam recognizes this and uh, understands that the main feature of attraction, as far as the females is concerned, is the hair. And this is, as well as her body generally, but this is not the case for females. And despite some calls in modern times that this might be the case this is rejected a notion that's rejected and rationally and intellectually is very well accepted and unfortunately we've seen how women have been somewhat used as cheap objects for the gratification of men in societies for adverts and for magazines and so on the element of the beauty of women in that regard and they've been told uh, somehow sold uh, and, and misused in that regard. Islam wants to cherish and protect the woman and indeed has legislated hijab as uh, a means of, of a identity because the Quran it says in verse 30, 59 of chapter 33 that they become the ambassadors of the religion of Islam but also uh, so that they are protected from molestation from sexual harassment, from uh, unnecessary advances and so-called um, gazes and so on. So the reason why, in fact, it's an honor and a sense of pride 
for the females to be indeed given this responsibility of adorning the Islamic dress code of hijab. While some will always argue that Islam has alienated women, the reality is that the religion has in fact given them rights and privileges that were too often ignored before the advent of Islam. In what was originally a barbaric, male-dominated society, women were seen as inferior in every respect. The Qur'an, however, sheds light on the true status of women, raising their station, giving them the appreciation and importance that has often gone unnoticed.